invite you to open up your uh, bulletin, the inside page, and take notes of everything that God is speaking to you, to you during this uh, message time, or anything that God has said to you during the, uh, any part of worship today. We are going to be in Luke chapter 8 this morning. Luke chapter 8. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it up. If you have a uh, uh, smartphone and you have an app, Bible app, go ahead and open that up. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 26. And I'll invite you to stand for the reading of the scripture this morning. <coughs> They sailed to the region of the Gerasene, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, he kept under guard and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven out by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the Jesus came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. He got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. You may be seated. And let's pray. Gracious God, I pray that we all come to hear your word today. I pray that the, that the words you speak, whether through me, through, through what was prepared, or in the quietness and the stillness of each person's heart, I pray that you are heard today. May you be glorified. And may the meditations of our mind and the thoughts of our heart be pleasing and glorious to you. Amen. So over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as witness in the Gospel of Luke. Why would we take the time to go through a specific series on the life of Christ? Because after all, we say we know who Jesus is, right? So why spend time to intentionally go through his entire life over a uh, eight-week period? For one thing... We, have, we have really have made Jesus into an impersonal being that we seek out to help us only when we're in trouble or in need of assistance. We've taken his humanity uh, that he doesn't even resemble humanity anymore. Remember, Jesus was human. He was and is God in flesh. Not only is Jesus human, he, he was, he, but he, all, he was also the epitome of how how humanity should live with each other and with God. He was fully divine and fully human. And at the same time, we remember that Jesus is also fully God. So he is fully human and fully divine, as I said. So the second person of the Trinity brings us closer into the relationship with God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we learn more about the kingdom of heaven and God's work in this world 
This was, was and is part of Jesus' mission. One of his first sermons was, was actually a reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Luke chapter 4 uh, illustrates this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me out to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, and Jesus gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were, fa were fastened on him. And, he, and Jesus began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So when Jesus picked this particular passage, he was saying a lot to the people in his hometown. Proclaiming the good news to the poor brings healing of the spirit. Pro proclaiming freedom for prisoners brings healing to societal status. Recovery of sight to the blind, seeing the oppressed free, brings healing to eyesight and brings healing to those who have been held captive. Wherever Jesus is, there is healing. And when we encounter Jesus Christ, you and I experience some form of healing. That's what Jesus does. Jesus brings healing. Jesus always meets us where we are, but he never leaves us as we are. He is constantly working to bring healing and wholeness into our lives. In the passage in Luke 8, we witness an exciting scene. You know, there are people that are going to say the Bible is boring and out of date, but you can find any and every type of story, any and every type of, 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 of human emotion in a reaction. And it's a really powerful story when you read it all together. And it shows the relationship between God and his people and people and their God. Jesus had just come from a situation where he calmed the wind and the sea. His disciples were witnesses to this, and they still had questions about who he was and what he could do. See, the thing that we need to remember and see is that Jesus does not leave things in a state of chaos. Jesus always brings peace among the chaos. Jesus always brings peace among the chaos of our lives what he does. We see evidence of this all the way back to the beginning of creation. The waters of the earth were chaotic and then God comes in and he brings order and peace and life. And the presence of Christ channels the chaos and always brings new life to the situation. Now we look at the demoniac. The man had been tortured in his soul causing him to act in ways that the people took notice of him. He looked and acted really strange. He lived in the tombs and did not wear any clothes. Now, I don't know about you, but if living in uh, but living in, in tombs would most likely change me too. Now, we're talking about the story of a demon possessed man, so I want to do a brief side note real quick. I'm often asked if I believe there are demons and if there's spiritual warfare going on. My answer is this. I don't think we take the spiritual realm serious enough whether we believe in it or we don't. I do know that Jesus took it serious and that he took uh, people being possessed by demons seriously. Now, this man saw Jesus coming. He fell to his feet and he made a scene by shouting, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? He's making a statement that he knows who Jesus is, and, and he, he's really kind of mocking Jesus in some way. He knows that Jesus has the power to free, free him from the, from the demons, but it's an excellent point here for us. We often say we believe in Jesus. And remember what James writes, you believe there is one God good, even the demons believe and shudder. So I do believe in the spiritual realm and believe there is stuff going on that we cannot imagine. But this is why trusting that Jesus will give and bring peace to our lives and to the world is important. The demons inside the man knew they were going to be cast out and go to a place they did not want to go. So if they didn't want to go there, why would we want to put ourselves in a state of living in that manner? We often say we believe in Jesus, but we don't really take it much further than that. 
Yes, believing in, G in Jesus is essential for our lives. But if we do not allow this belief to come from our head and go into our hearts to transform our lives from the inside out, then we're going to have other forces take over our lives. Forces of alcohol, drugs, bitterness, anger, sex, lust, hatred, selfishness, indifference to any type of suffering around our community and the world. And this list can go on and on. All of this will consume our lives, lives and cause us to act out in ways that God did not intend for us to act. The power of sin in our world and in our lives is stronger than we realize. Sin has already possessed the world. And without Jesus, there's no hope, no freedom. There's only chaos in our inner selves, our mental being, our emotional being, and our relationships. Now, we like to think that here in America, we're above demon possession. But also remember, what we do allows other things to control our lives instead of God. So in a way, we become possessed by many other forces and other situations and people and things around us. We all have different voices in our head trying to lead us. Voices of darkness and voices of light and light. When we listen to the voice of darkness, we can see and live into the, uh, a life of chaos. Yet we are unable to break free from the chaos because it has tormented our lives so much that we truthfully have become enslaved to it. And that's why in the great thanksgiving for uh, communion, we say that he has broken, he, he, has, uh, he has set us free from the slavery of sin and death. And notice what the demon-possessed man says, I beg you, don't torture me. The demons inside him have the man convinced that Jesus is there to torture him. See, when the darkness fills our lives so much, it's really challenging to believe that Jesus brings anything other than torture because that means we have to change. And change to many people is torture. Right? Amen. Y'all are still quiet. The point of all this is that evil is real in our world and within ourselves. But evil never has the final say. Jesus does. Jesus does give permission for the demons or the evil to speak just a bit. But then it is in his power that he drives them out and sends the demons away to where they will be tortured and, and break free of their control over people. So today, what are you struggling with that has a tight grip on you that is not letting you live into the full and complete life that Jesus Christ offers? What are you holding on to that is proved fully or that is preventing you from fully loving God and loving people and trusting in God completely? As 2 Corinthians 10 says, take every thought and make it captive to Christ. Name it. And claim the power of Christ over it and then confess to other people. We must go to others, confess our sins, and, and articulate how Jesus is breaking us free from the powers of darkness. If we do not, then we are still living with selfishness in our own ability to get through life, which will wear us down. We are to have a group of people, whatever size, to help us and walk with us as we are stepping out with God to follow Jesus. We will fail on our own, but there are people around us who will pick us up. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Personally, I have a core group of friends that I can be genuine with. And these friends have been by my side for years, and I've been by their side. Together, we hold each other accountable to live into the light and, and not to pick up the chains of enslavement to sin again. Sometimes we have to help each other remove those chains from, the, from each other. There are times this may seem uh, to bring chaos and torture into our lives because we don't want anyone to think less of us or to see us as anything than perfect. But see, the truth is when we tell, uh, when we confess to other people, the light is shining on our sin. It's brought into the open and peace can finally enter in. It is Jesus who brings the peace. Whenever and whoever Jesus heals, peace has come into the picture. Remember, he's sitting quietly.
quietly at Jesus' feet in awe and reverence. Do you feel like you live in peace today, here and now? Then come and face down, put your face down to the feet of Jesus and cry out to him, Lord, save me, free me, I only want you. And right after this scene, Jesus and his disciples were traveling. And we see two more things. One of the raising of the dead girl, and the other is cured of the issue of blood. Now there's a couple things that are going on here. One is that Jesus brings life to wherever he goes. See, when he proclaims the kingdom of God is at hand, this is where real life is experienced. It is living in the full presence of eternal life, the full presence of God, here and now, and in the life to come. So because of Jesus, we experience new life. Because of Jesus, we experience new life. The other thing that's happened is, is that's happening is someone who was outcasted in society, someone who was told that they had to stay away from everyone. We have people like this today. All we have to do is drive down 7th Street downtown, and we see the people the rest of society has cast out for one reason or another. So when have you experienced shame for a condition that you might have? When have you experienced uh, rejection from people just because you may not have been like everyone else? When have you been told that you weren't good enough and people withdrew themselves from you? But see, something incredible about Jesus is that he did not <coughs> heal the condition of the person. He healed the state of their social status as well. Jesus' healing was not only so the physical aspects of the person would be healed and whole, but Jesus also healed people so they could experience wholeness as part of the community. He restored them to be able to be with society and not live on the fringes anymore. Why? Because Jesus brings healing, wholeness, restoration to mind, body, and relationships. He brings healing, wholeness, and restoration to mind, to the body, and to relationships. So have we taken time to seek Jesus, not just to fix our physical illnesses or injuries, but to restore our relationship with Him and other people? We do get fixated on, on healing our bodies, which we need to pray to God about that. But we can also forget at times that Jesus is also working to fix all of us, all parts of who we are, and make us whole. He is working to heal our physical bodies, as well as our emotional self, our uh, mental self, and our relationships with Him and with other people. So when we talk to God about praying for healing, remember what Jesus did and focus on the bigger picture of a complete picture of healing. The physical healing is more about making us able to be part of society once again. It removes the conditions that, that people can outcast others. And Jesus is working in and through us to make us whole people. Not just putting band-aids on injuries, but healing us. So we can be healed mentally, emotionally, and relationally, and relationally with others, ourselves, and Him. Because sometimes illnesses that we have, the physical illnesses we have, do a toll on our mind and our emotions and in relationships. So Jesus brings healing. But another aspect of Jesus' healing ministry that we need to pay attention to, Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers forgiveness. Remember that we are so messed up by sin, by, by sin and enslavement to the power of sin and temptations that we need to hear and understand this. God forgives you. God forgives you. Look at the person next to you and say, God forgives you. God is not in the business of making us feel guilty about anything that we have done wrong. He is not interested in continually reminding us of, of our fail, failures. God is interested in healing us from the inside out with the power of forgiveness driven by his great love for you and for me. Guilt and shame will weigh us down. And when we do wrong, 
we remember and our minds are tortured because we relive, relive the tapes of our sin over and over again in our minds. We do this with other people as well, too. Just look at the news, newspaper, Facebook, or any social media. Society loves to remind people and show people how they messed up. But we don't like it when other people point out our sin. But we bring it into the light. And we, and, and we remember that Jesus brings forgiveness, which brings healing and wholeness and peace to our lives so that we can share his peace, grace, and mercy to others. He allows us to be part of building the kingdom of heaven with every step we take, every word we speak, every time we encounter another person in person or online interaction. And as forgiven people, we do not have the right to hold anyone's sin against them. Because if, for God, if God can forgive you, and if God can forgive me, then we have the responsibility and mandate to bring the forgiveness of Christ with us wherever we are. We can do this with those people that we hold dear to our hearts. Because it's easier, in some respects, to opt to to seek and offer forgiveness to our families. Maybe harder in some instances as well. Maybe easier to offer forgiveness to those who we may consider to be our enemies or those who may consider to be who, who may they may consider to be our enemies. Can we offer forgiveness to all people? Jesus was constantly proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor by announcing the kingdom of heaven wherever he went. This is the year when all people would be free from their sin. We are the people that God has called, that God is transforming, and God has sealed to go into the world, to be with the people, to help release them from the power of sin and temptations in their life. Jesus has an incredible way of bringing peace with him wherever he is. And since we are the body of Christ in the world, let us do whatever we can to bring his peace and grace and not cause others to feel guilt or shame any longer. <coughs> Forgiveness is a powerful healer. Remember, I, I, I like to say, if we don't offer forgiveness, it's like us drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. <laughs> Forgiveness can mend relationships, even while on a deathbed. Forgiveness heals, restores, and brings wholeness. And remember, Jesus, the great healer who comes to forgive, to heal, and restore our standing with God and with other people. So come, all you who are...